so we'll we'll begin here with um, uh, with an image uh, that is one of his most recent large-scale screen prints. Um, he works with a a group um, uh, known as Brandex Editions on these large-scale silk screens. Um, oftentimes, these works are pretty much a one-to-one -one adaptation of composition from the uh, original oil painting that again is produced over the period of months, in this case a self-portrait where he's smiling, which is, um, if you think about back to the late 60s, his, his, um, his notion of creating a very um, uh, desensitized, very straightforward, mugshot-like type image. And over the, the years, and I would say more so in the past 10 or 15 years, has he started to experiment with, with um, facial expressions. As a matter of fact, the most recent uh, tapestry, one of the most recent tapestries that he created of Barack, Barack Obama, there's one where he's a little more stoic looking and another one where it's just a full on smile. And in this case, he's introducing something that's very, uh, that's not in keeping with what was his original intent and then, uh, and then was pretty much in place. These very straightforward, um, um, stern kind of gla uh, gazes um, over 30 years. But he's been experimenting with these uh, more uh, expressive um, uh, uh, smiles. There's more, again, there's this one, there's the image of Barack Obama, three quarter profile, uh, full profile images. So again, challenging himself with regards to the to the initial set of rules that he set up for himself and you're going to see a number of these large cell large scale silk, silk screens as we go through the exhibition but in a piece like this there might be as many as um, 200 or 250 different colors that go into making this up so there's so there's that many colors that are actually being applied to one sheet of paper to build up this image and multiple multiple screens so for instance if you have this area in the background that's pretty much a consistent um, body of, of muted colors there could be as many as three or four silk screens that are uh, dedicated to that one area and then it's built up with the with the deep uh, with the deep blues and the olive greens and the deep burgundies and building it up building it up from 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 darkest values to lightest values now as he's working on his paintings he's all he he always works from um, from from top corner to bottom corner. Or in some cases, he will, he will turn up. If he's working on one where the grids turn on a 45 degree angle, the grid is then, uh, the painting is actually tilted on a 45 degree angle. So he's working on a, on a parallel line to, to his position looking at it. So when it gets to this stage and there's, there's actual images that are being produced in, in, in this edition fashion, it's a buildup overall of values. You'll see with the scribble etchings downstairs, you'll see that there's kind of an all over um, uh, application of colors and he's not just confining himself to the, the various grid cells as he would be if he were working on these um, individually. This is also a good point to talk a little bit about um, about the, the use of the grid, which is something that has been in place with all of his mature work. And in my conversations with Karen, it dawned on me that it was really the printmaking medium that brought the grid to the fore. Now the grid has been used for centuries in taking smaller sketches and certainly if you think about um, the Renaissance masters who are creating these large scale uh, uh, frescoes where you have your preparatory studies and then you may lay a, an inch by inch grid over top of that and then each of those inch by inch cells then correlate to a foot by foot square on the surface that you may be working on. And um, so with the early works, he was again using the grid, working from a black and white photographic image to a, a monumental scale painting. If you're able to see those works in person, you do see the faintest ghost image of those pencil marks of the grid on the finished painting. But he was very much about diffusing that making that systematic approach disappear. You'll, again, you'll see some other works downstairs that speak more to that in a more physical way, but we'll get to that in just a minute. But it was with his, his experimentation beginning in 1972 with the printmaking medium 
that he began to see the value of the grid as a compositional element. So whereas it, the grid kind of vanished and was playing a supporting role in the, in the finished artwork early on, you think about that as being a backbone. And as the grid becomes more and more prominent, it becomes more of an exoskeleton, right? So he's thinking about these, these, um, these ideas and notions of letting the grid be as much of a, a part of activating that picture plane as, as, um, as, as what he might be doing inside those little individual cells. Now, he, in his graduate school days and shortly thereafter, he was very adept at uh, and, and produced a lot of abstract paintings. As a matter of fact, one of his early graduate school era paintings came up on uh, Antiques Roadshow. And, um, and he, he, I, read it, I was reading an interview and he, he thought it was laughable, the estimate that they put on it. Um, but quite frankly, it's you know, still a chuck close. Uh, and there's a lot of the DNA in, in a work like that that goes into these things now because his hero was Willem de Kooning. A lot of painters had de Kooning as a, as a, as a hero. And he said when he met de Kooning that when he shook his hand he said it's finally it's, it's, I'm finally glad to meet somebody who's painted more de Koonings than I have, <laughs> speaking to de Kooning himself. And so in these little cell areas, he calls these his little de Koonings because he's in there playing around, he's in there having fun, and uh, speaking with a couple of uh, individuals who are far more knowledgeable uh, about uh, Chuck Close's work and, and the art historical um, references, significance, etc. One of the things they keep coming back to is the fact that, you know, he's working on these pretty much at arm's length. Uh, there are periods where, you know, he'll back up and it's actually his Bond Street studio is just one long shaft and there's only room for one big painting at a time to go on the back wall and that's where his workstation is. And, you know, they'll back up and look at it and so forth. But, but really, the, the, the lion's share of the work that he's doing is always very, very much uh, up on the image itself. And invariably, the result of all of those thousands of little actions result in something like this. Um, as many of you know, in 1988, he suffered um, a collapsed artery in his spine, uh, which left him um, uh, paralyzed, actually fully paralyzed from the neck down uh, for, for um, several weeks, if not months. And slowly over time, he was able to build back some, some use of his arms and there was a period when he, had, when he got back into the studio where he was actually holding the brush in his, in his mouth. But that, wasn't, that actually did not, um, uh, that particular uh, approach was not in place for that long. Uh, he still wears an arm brace as, as he works uh, to, to actually support um, the, the, his wrist as he's working. So it's a lot of full arm actions. And there are a number of people uh, the late Kirk Varnado in particular that have said that the work that he was that he was doing prior to what is referred to as his accident um, the work that he was doing up to the point of the accident and the first painting he did afterwards there doesn't appear to be that big of a difference because quite frankly the trajectory he was going in, in terms of breaking down that pictorial plane from the highly photographic to the more um, to the more abstract, he's even, uh, he's even been quoted as saying that he sees it as being something that propelled him along the path much faster. So again, looking at that, at that instance where something that could be um, uh, interpreted and, and dealt with in a very negative way turning out to be something that's, that's used in a very, um, in a very positive way.